Hello, I'm David Hunt. My next guest is a world-renowned artist and he specialises in botanical drawings and paintings uh, and also some other interesting stuff along the way, which we'll get to that. John, Hi. welcome. Thank you. What is your surname? It's one of those, you know, like it's two, two. And it's a double barrel yeah. surname. A lot of people call me JPP because when they see my surname, they, they panic. But it's Spanish of origin and it's Pastoriza Pinol. Okay, well, we'll come back to that because that heritage I'm, I really want to know about. But where did it come from, botanical drawings? It's such an old school form of um, art. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, obviously, it has a lot of, um, uh, I guess, history uh, and it goes right back to, um, I guess, plant identification and herbals, etc. And it's what also, you know, the first fleet came out That's with, right, yeah. with so, people, you know, like, and they took those drawings back. Yeah, so it was a way that uh, we were able to, I guess, document the natural world, but in a way that we could use it for identification, as well as something that is quite attractive and mm. beautiful to hang on the wall. I was always a gardener. I always loved gardening. What, is, even as a kid? Even as a kid, yeah. Right. Uh, we used to have a big block out in um, suburbia. My parents uh, had children because they didn't want to do domestic chores, so it was a form of slave labour. <laughs> My sister would clean the house, I would clean the garden. Right. And so... Um, Did you hate doing it? Ah, uh, weeding was terrible. Yeah. Yeah, because we just had lots of weeds. So. <laughs> <laughs> and not the fun ones like oxylus, so you had to really dig out the, yeah, whole, the yeah. whole thing. But I really enjoyed being outdoors and I just really enjoyed, um, uh, you know, watching or experiencing the year through um, the rise and fall of plants and flowers, etc. So it gave you a real sense of seasonality and, and gave you a real uh, joy when things would flower again um, and when you would plant. And it's, it was really, it was really just a really good, um, I guess, childhood, really. Mm. But what about the drawing? When, when did that so start? So I always loved doing art. I really wanted to try and see if I could uh, combine both of my interests, being gardening and, and painting, and this was a perfect marriage. So uh, I remember one morning my mother woke me up and said, we're going off to the Melbourne Herbarium. There's uh, a woman who's just finished painting a, a series of Banksias, and this, of course, was Celia Rossa. And this was her third volume of the genus Banksia. It was the most incredible uh, monograph of all of the um, species of Banksia growing in Australia. Yeah. And she would probably spend maybe about, oh, a whole year just working on maybe one or two paintings. They were just incredibly detailed, wow. botanically accurate, and they yeah. were just incredible. And when I saw them, I went, this is what I want to do. So how wonderful that your mother mm. took you. Yeah. You know, like, what, you know, like, where, did, where did that come from with her? Um, I think she heard it on the radio that morning. So right, <laughs> she okay. thought, best way to get out of the house. So, <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, what were mm. you like uh, as a kid before we get into mm. your, your career? You know, like, you were obviously you know, slave labour, as yeah, you said, mm. you know, like the weeds in the garden. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but did you have fun as a kid? Yeah, I did. I, I think I really had a childhood and uh, I remember later in life someone said to me, enjoy your youth, you only have it once. And I really feel sorry for a lot of young people these days. You know, they want to mature so much earlier than yep. what they need to. Yep. Were you a late um, a, a bloomer? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still wanted to play with my toys. Yeah, and, yeah, good on you. Yeah. And still believe in Father Christmas. Oh, to an extent, yeah. <laughs> He hasn't brought me my presents yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> and were you drawing at home at yeah. the age of what? what? So I always was um, really, I love drawing. Uh, handwriting for me was really terrible. I, I still have the worst handwriting, you can imagine. But the way that I would be able to communicate the way I saw the world was through mark making and that was through pictures. And I just loved um, drawing all the time. And then, you know, Later in my education, I really wanted to pursue art, and my parents said, we're not sending you to private school to do um, art, you know, you have to do sciences, you know, we need you to become a doctor or, you know, um, um, a, you know a chemist or something like that. So there was times when the door was shut in the house and the parents would be like, what are you doing in there? So don't come in. <laughs> Because I'll be drawing. Um, so you weren't yeah. doing anything else. You weren't doing anything <laughs> naughty. You were drawing. I was drawing. Um, but yeah, it was um, something I really loved. And I guess my parents tried to um, entertain that, that pursuit, but not try and make it something that was a vocation. They were really concerned that I'd become a starving artist in a garret. Uh, but anyway, so... <laughs> 
I live in a garret. <laughs> <laughs> I then went on and uh, went to university. I yep. studied a science degree at Monash Uni. I then got a chance to go and do an honours degree, at, sorry, did my undergraduate at Monash, uh, my honours at Melbourne Uni. And then I had an opportunity to go study in Spain, which was amazing. Because of your heritage? Because or? of my heritage. Right. And uh, they, uh, my supervisor at the time went to a, a conference in, in Cardiff and met with some other scientists. And they said, we're really looking for um, HDR candidates or PhD candidates. Mm -hmm. Do you have anyone who's interested? And I just went, yes. And could you speak? Not a word. Oh, OK. Not so you word. didn't grow up speaking Spanish? No, no. What about grandparents? Were they here? Or? No, they were all in, oh, were okay. all in Spain. Right. So yeah, yep. so because um, my father's Spanish, my mother's Australian. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, and so off you went. Off I went. So I submerged myself into this completely unusual environment because at that stage I'd never travelled. Yeah. Or travelled consciously. I'd been overseas when I was two or four, but I can't remember that. Yeah. So I really submerged myself into this incredible culture not many people spoke english mm. so i had to try and make do and i had i had was it secondary school french so <laughs> i was trying to use and french grammar spain. while speaking spanish and people <laughs> just went it's not going to work so i was mute i think for the first two months right and then they have this amazing phenomenon where within two months something goes click and you're listening to someone or watching the television and you understand every word oh, it right. is it is unusual okay yeah and so I just um, picked it up. You were over there, mm. um, yeah, like all those beautiful Latin men. <laughs> how how did were, were you? <laughs> so were you were you out there? Yes, I was. Yes, right. Yeah, and yeah, like so. What what was that like being? In it Europe? was really interesting. Um, this is this is my observation. I believe that the women there were incredibly attractive. The men, not so much. If really? you went over the border into Portugal, yeah. they were all pretty much the um, the men that you would see on the front cover of um, European Vogue. I mean, they yep. were just drop dead gorgeous. Okay. You know, olive skin, chiseled features. Yeah. And then you hop over back into Spain. It's like. Mm -mm. <laughs> wow. Well, maybe it was a part of Spain that you were in. Most probably, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, how long did you stay in Spain? I was there for three years. Okay. Yeah. So you came back. Yep. When did all the art come so to the surface? So when I was, when I was um, studying in Spain, um, obviously being a poor student, I didn't have um, a television uh, in my, my apartment. So I would spend the evening either just going out, enjoying um, the nightlife. Yep. Um, during the week, I would um, work on my, my thesis or I would actually uh, paint. And so I started uh, drawing and painting plants unique to that part of Spain and it's the northwest part so you would things that you wouldn't think would grow there like irises and daffodils and crocus I mean it's so unique and for me these were rare plants and so I'd see them go these are so expensive back home yeah and they take a huge amount of time and effort in to grow them and they yeah. just they flower here without any yeah without any assistance so yeah. I was just amazed with the the variation and, and the speciation of the, the plants there had mm. you studied drawing and painting at that stage no this is all self-taught i realized that um I'd, I'd completed some works and i sent them home and um my parents were like oh this is interesting we didn't know you could do this <laughs> to this extent and um, they suggested when I came back home, maybe pursue it a bit better. Okay. Uh, and that's when I uh, started doing it formally. And I started studying with Jenny Phillips, who is a renowned uh, botanical artist here in, in Melbourne. But of course, she's known worldwide. Yep. And I started with her and I went into remedial. So everything I was doing was wrong. I didn't know how to draw properly. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you didn't because you hadn't been trained. Hadn't been trained. Yeah. Um, my paints were wrong, brushes were wrong, paper was wrong, everything was wrong. So I went into remedial class. And so I was in remedial for about three months. Yeah. And, but I did my homework. Um, and then after a time, I was catching up with everyone. And then within a year, she offered me a position because I had all the botanical knowledge. Mm. So I knew about uh, what we needed to draw, what we needed to include in a plant portrait to make sure that it was botanically accurate. Right. Yeah. And then it's just 
journeyed on from there. Journeyed on from there. You work at RMIT. I work at RMIT, yes. What do you do there? So uh, I've been at RMIT now about 15 years. Yeah. Um, I started, um, only, it was only meant to be there 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we call it Hotel California. You can try and check out, but never leave. <laughs> I was working with the College of Business um, in various roles um, and in the professional staff role. Um, and so I'd be helping out in terms of um, marketing events, communications, um, even through to the face-to-face -face student interactions. So All completely right. different side of the brain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, like here you are, an, a, a renowned artist, <laughs> and you're you know, like the science stuff as yeah, well, yeah, and yeah. you don't use it. it your day -to -day life. Well, I think I do. There's some things that I've learnt that can be adapted uh, into the workplace. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, how did it happen that mm. you became this mm. uh, famous artist and you now tra travel the world, mostly mm. into America, yeah. to and you teach people? Yes. Now, how did that all happen? So, um, I wanted to do a solo show, and this is back in 2005. And I would go to galleries here in Melbourne and they would be very disinterested, I think, in the art form. And we kept on saying there's this cultural cringe that exists. And some people said that what I did was... Um, twee? Not twee, but it was actually pure documentation devoid of social uh, narrative and context. Oh, oh End go. quote. Yeah. So <laughs> for me, it was very difficult to try and... Um, tap into the contemporary art market here in Australia. So I thought I would go where the epicentre was, and that was Britain. Right. So London, uh, London was hard as well, but um, I found a gallery in London, and that was through the help of Austrade and mm -hmm. the Australian, um, the High Commissioner. Yep, fantastic. Uh, which was great. And we did an event that would coincide with the Chelsea Flower Show. Uh -huh. And so we were in a part of London that was on the way to Chelsea. So we were just off Pimlico Road in Belgravia, so a really nice place. Yeah. And it went really well. And so from there, I got an unusual letter when I returned back from from uh, London. And I was a bit worried because I thought, I wonder if it was the government. But I had this letter that held the plumes on it and it was actually from Clarence House, which was Whoa. from Prince Charles. Yeah. And someone from his um, office had been to the exhibition yeah. and brought him back a catalogue. And he was currently working on the Highgrove Floral Legion, which was one of the first floral legions, I, I think, since uh, King George. Um, looking at a collection or an anthology of, of, of plant paintings. Mm. And so he was looking at the plants growing in Highgrove and it was a huge project. And I was involved with that, which was, out, it was amazing. Wow. And from there, um, everything just started to snowball um, in a good way. So I was then invited to submit work to the Hunt Institute, which is based in uh, Pittsburgh through Carnegie Mellon uh, University. And it's one of the biggest repositories of botanical works in the world. And it's quite prestigious to get work selected and included in that collection. Yeah. Um, and then I started doing a lot more activity. I was then um, picked up by Nellie Caston, um, uh, who's a very well-known uh, gallerist, an uh, amazing uh, contemporary art um, uh, gallery. And so I did a few shows with her. I'm now with Scott Livesey Gallery. Street Armadale, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. And I've also been recently involved with the Transylvania Flora Legion. So I got a chance to go to Transylvania and stay at um, Prince Charles's um, residence. <laughs> and I was there for three weeks documenting the plants growing in that part of Romania, which was incredible. Would you like to be doing this full time? Or oh, of course. <laughs> but but why, why isn't it? Because you, you are so well known yeah. and you are well known around the world mm. that uh, how come that you, that something hasn't happened that you you can do it as, on a full-time basis? I think basis? this is a thing that we look at, at with creatives um, it's, it's very difficult to sustain um, a career Absolutely. Um, and we say that in terms of the percentage of people who do really well or succeed is yep. probably less than one percent so um, many creatives do need to find another form of income or another income stream for me, I prefer like a nice steady trajectory, mm. <laughs> trajectory. <laughs> uh, but it's um, it's a hard slog, but you do it because you love it. Yep. Yeah. So yep. for me, uh, my day job keeps me in my apartment and pays for the day to day. My teaching and my art 
of course, then um, can sustain me beyond mm. what I need to. Now, apart from your art mm. uh, in the botanical world, yeah. you're like, um, I can see you've got a pair of leather <laughs> pants and boots on today. Yep. You um, have, have taken a nice little twist and yeah, turn yeah. in an exhibition that, that was just on here yes. in Melbourne. Yes. Where you actually draw, uh, uh, you know, people's form yes. in leather. In leather, yes. Uh, w why and how <laughs> and why not? I've always been interested in leather. Yep. Um, and we always say here in Melbourne, Melbourne is a leather city. Yep. And we have a really strong subculture of, of leather men and leather fetishists. Mm -hmm. uh, and every year we celebrate AWOL, which is the August week of leather. Yep. It was a couple of years ago, I was invited to um, uh, put some work forward for the Men on Men competition through the Laird Hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I decided that I want to have a go at looking if I could paint leather like I do a flower. So this was a, um, a challenge that was given to me uh, and it did very well and it won the competition. Well, of course it would. And so as part of that, then I had to then create a, a, a wider scope. I ended up presenting it to my, my gallerist and he thought someone had dropped in a Tom of Finland work. Because <laughs> it's so yeah, different, yeah, it's isn't it? It is so different. Everyone says it was such a departure. I said it's not a departure, mm. it's more of an extrapolation. My last show was looking at flowers that look like people, either expressing either phallic or yonic qualities. What I want to do with the leather pieces is to focus on erogenous zones, yep. but to paint them like they look like flowers. So the painting technique is exactly the same technique I'd use to paint a botanical specimen, but in this situation, it is uh, more, um, you know, leather and, and fetish. So and, yeah. and you're right, mm. and you've created it, and mm. you're like, you explaining it there. I can see it when I look at your leather um, artwork yeah. that it and it flows and it's just and it, and it fits the body, doesn't yes. it? Yeah, you know, like yeah. it re really. Uh, and the detail that yeah. you put in it is like a detail of what you would get yeah. from a, a flower or what whatever um, yeah. botanical piece you, you're doing. So you've really captured it. You, yeah. w so you must be very happy with oh, what I've, you've done. I've really enjoyed it. It was, uh, for me, it was a really interesting um, submersion into mm -hmm. trying to create that sensation because mm -hmm. when we look at a flower, we, we find it attractive. Yep. And I wanted to try and see if I can do that with the human form, mm -hmm. mainly the, the male form. And it's interesting, a lot of people who've really responded to this work were women more so than men. Yeah, I find that very I, interesting. I know, and I thought I was, my main target audience I was hoping was men, but women yep. have been really, really enamored with. Yep. And I have to realize that they still find that part of the, the male um, form to be also yep. as equally attractive. Because it's a snapshot, isn't they it? It's, are. Not, it's not a full body. What I was trying to do is to really um, focus in on certain areas. It's almost like playing with a little bit of um, abstraction mm. um, so that you really need to have a look and understand what you're looking at, whether it be a torso, um, legs, a crotch, or a rear end. <laughs> yeah, and so you put this exhibition on. Mm, yep. uh, were people shocked when they walked past the gallery? Uh, yeah, like and thinking, and were yeah, like, and it was very bold of the gallery to say, yes, "Come on, let's yes. do it." Yes, So um, Scott uh, is very, um, very appreciative and and really accommodating when it comes to various. Um, areas within, uh, within art. When I presented this one in terms of looking at eroticism and fetishism, he was a little bit concerned, but he was, he was intrigued. Yep. He, he, really, he was very proud to show the works on, on the walls. And what we did as a part of a special event is we had an evening where we invited a lot of um, my friends and colleagues, my brethren, we say, um, to come to the gallery in full gear. Yep. So almost they were contextualizing the works on the wall. Mm -hmm. They were almost forming a, an art installation. Mm -hmm. And it was really great because people were able to um, witness this subculture in a completely different environment and understand 
that you know people are very proud to wear what they do yep. and um, there's quite a lot of us yep. who uh, who relate to it which yep. is really good yeah so on that mm. on, on that platform because of the botanical work overseas mm. Mm. has anyone noticed it yet through you know because of the the wonderful world of um, social media <laughs> social media um, has anyone picked up on it yet uh, especially I'm, out of Europe I was hoping that um, there may have been a little bit of interest in Berlin um, mm. I'm hoping to take some images with me over to New York and show them to a few um, galleries there. Yeah. Um, but some good news is that we have some of the work that's going to be uh, used in a show later in, uh, or curated in a show at RMIT Gallery at the end of the year, oh, which is really exciting. Excellent. So it's looking at uh, pleasure in the body. Yeah. So um, that's really good. So I'm looking right. at for more um, opportunities to have these works curated. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your next move, John? You're like, is it you're like sticking with the, the, the leather? But you know, your huge success is obviously with the botanical mm. side. What, what it, what's your next step? So I'd like to try and inter, intersect both of those. Yep. I don't know how that's going to manifest. Yep. <laughs> well, I'm well, trying so to. Different. But, they are. but good on you, yeah, because yeah. why not try yeah. to? to make that happen. Yes, so um, the next, I think the next body of work I'm working on is going back to uh, botanical and still life, mm. um, but I'd still like to keep this bubbling away. Well, can't wait to see what you do next. I've yeah. always been a big fan <laughs> and you know that, and, uh, and always lovely chatting with you. Thank you. I'm David Hunt, we'll see you soon.